Thank you, Mark. Those were very appropriate songs for the psalm we're going to be looking at today as, as uh, we are drawn into this worship and praise to God. Uh, I can't really remember a time that I wasn't in church. I mean, I've grown up in church. But it took me a long time to come to the realization of two things. One is that ritualistic religion is about as nourishing as eating sawdust. The second thing is how easy it is to get drawn into the tentacles of ritualistic religion. And today I'm hoping, through the psalm that we're going to be looking at, that we can be drawn into something deeper. Because... So many Christians, and I know this sounds judgmental, and I'm not standing here saying I have arrived, I'm in a journey, okay? But too many Christians do not know a vital, fresh, daily relationship with Jesus Christ. And they settle for something much less. Someone has rightly said, much of our religious activity today is nothing more than a cheap anesthetic to deaden the pain of an empty life. There's an author by the name of Richard Foster who's written a number of books on spiritual disciplines, and Foster says this, superficiality is the curse of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. The desperate need today is not for a great number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. And so today, today I want to encourage us to go deep. I want to talk about getting out of a religious rut, a place where there is little life, a place where there is little passion and a place that often leads to a dead faith. And maybe you're here with us this morning thinking, well, Christianity is nothing but, but a boring rut. Or maybe you're here this morning as one who is in a season where things are just dry. What can we do about it? I think Psalm 63 can help us. And Psalm 63, by the way, is Beverly's favorite psalm. She doesn't recite it out loud, but when she wakes up every morning, she recites this psalm. It's been a psalm to which she has clung to. And so it gives me even more of a purpose or reason for wanting to share this psalm with you today. The first thing that I would suggest that we do if we want to climb out of a spiritual rut and go deep is to seek His presence. And I want to speak to that for a moment before we get to the psalm. But if you feel like that you're in a spiritual rut, what's your plan? What's your plan for getting out? Because if you're not intentional about it, guess where you're going to stay? You're going to stay in that spiritual rut. Nobody's ready for the depths until they are fed up with the superficial. And the way out is to be intentional about actively seeking God. Because God desires a deep relationship with you. God desires an intimate relationship with you. God desires a personal relationship with you. And this might surprise you. God hates religion. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Religion does not give you life. Religion does not change us. 
Here's the definition from the American Collegiate Dictionary. This is how it defines religion. The practice of sacred rites, rules, or a set of beliefs generally agreed upon by a number of persons or sects. I want you to just sit with that for a moment. Look at the definition of religion. I mean, doesn't that just make you want to go, yeah, buddy! I mean, doesn't that excite you? Well, I, I forgot, we're in church, so we, we save our excitement for other places, right? Not in here. Of course it doesn't. D does that make you say, I want to give my life to that? No. What if your spouse asked you, how do you see our marriage right now? Assuming you're married. What if your spouse asked you, how do you see our marriage right now? <clears throat> and your response was, well, our marriage is the practice of rules and rituals and beliefs. Your marriage would immediately become a PG-13 marriage. Do you know what a PG-13 marriage is? Strong language and violence, but no sexual content. <clears throat> I mean, everyone knows that doing things out of obligation, doing things out of routine does not make for a healthy relationship. And that's why God hates religion. Who did Jesus get most upset at when he was on this earth? The religious leaders. Why did he get upset at the religious leaders? Because all they cared about was keeping their nitpicking rules and they were not pursuing a relationship with Yahweh, their God. So Paul says this in Galatians chapter 2. I'm reading from the message. He says, Is it not clear to you that to go back to that old rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God? I refuse to do that to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule-keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. David, <clears throat> the writer of Psalm 63, <clears throat> knew the importance of going deep with God. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so here's the superscription from Psalm 63. It says, a psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. Now that tells us a little bit, but it doesn't tell us everything because we know at least twice he was out in the desert of Judah. Was this when he was fleeing from Saul? Or was this after David has been king and now Absalom is trying to take his throne from him and David's again on the run out in the desert of Judah? I tend to think it's probably the second one because he's going to speak about things he remembers about when he was in Jerusalem. So it doesn't matter, though. What's obvious, as we read this psalm in a moment, is that he is far from the holy city. He's in the wilderness. But while he's there in the wilderness, maybe, maybe fleeing for his life, maybe having his throne taken from him, his thoughts are not on his throne. His thoughts are not on his palace. His thoughts are not on even his family and friends. His thoughts are on God's house. I understand it's not the same as us having our thoughts on a church building because in David's day, God's house was where the presence of God dwelt. And so that's where his thoughts are. And that tells us a lot about David's heart, doesn't it? Because think about this with me. If we were in exile, Far from any comforts, what are we going to be thinking about? 
So the first verse, I think, sets the tone for the whole song. When David says this, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. Some translations say aches for you in a dry and parched land where there's no water. David is in the desert. He's in solitude, which solitude, by the way, has often been referred to as the furnace of transformation. Solitude is not a five-minute pit stop where you get everything fixed and then you get back into the race. David's tired. He's hiding. He's hungry. He's thirsty. And yet, it's not the physical things that he desires. He wants God. And look at the strong words he uses to describe how much he wants God. He says, I earnestly seek you. He says, my whole being longs for you. He says, I'm in a dry and weary or dry and parched land where there is no water. That's a vivid picture of what life is like for those who don't know God. A dry and parched land where there is no water. But it's also a vivid picture for people who only know religion. There is an inner barrenness in the souls of people who only know religion because it cannot fill. And so many people try to quench their thirst by doing right things. Nothing wrong with doing right things. But they try and quench this spiritual part of them by coming to church or having a Bible sitting on their coffee table or having religious bumper stickers on their car. But I want you to notice David's one desire. I earnestly seek you. I thirst for you. So, here's our first clue to having a vital walk with God. Our first clue of getting out of the rut. And here's the thing. We are not going to search for or thirst for someone if we don't realize our need for them. So let me make you very aware of your need. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, Therefore, no one... Do you know what no one means in Greek? No one... Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Here's our need. We're all sinners. Every last one of us. And if you think that because you're a pretty good person, or if you think because you keep religious rituals, that now God owes you heaven, you have been grossly misinformed. The only way to heaven is through trusting Jesus Christ. And God wants us with him so badly that he created within our souls a spiritual vacuum that nothing else can fill but him and when he isn't allowed to fill it something's always going to be missing and no amount of religious ritual is going to fill it 
So it starts with the longing. So here's a question. What if you treated the person or persons that you love the same way you treat God? What if you made time for that person that you love one or two hours a week? And during that one or two hours a week, when you're with that person that you love, you act bored, you act like you've been inconvenienced, you're constantly checking your watch, you're thinking about when you can get away from this situation, And what if you never really talked to that person that you love unless you needed something from them? What kind of relationship would you have? What kind of relationship would that be? And how long do you think that relationship would last? So the first step in building a fresh, dynamic relationship with God is to seek His presence moment by moment. But here's the second thing, is to honor Him. If you want to climb out of the rut and begin to live a fresh, vibrant relationship with God, honor Him. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means to give Him your priority. It means to give Him your worship. David honored God with great passion all his life. So let's read about some ways in this psalm that he honored God. First of all, he honors God by mentally picturing what God has done for him. And I would suggest we need to do the same thing. To mentally picture what God's done for you. He says, now remember, he's out in the wilderness. And he says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Now obviously, David's not speaking literally here because he's in the wilderness. He's framing a mental picture of the Lord in his power and in his glory. He has seen God in his sanctuary. Has he really seen him? No, but he's got a mental picture of God in his sanctuary. And he's also seen God when he was out there shepherding the sheep. And he's seen God when he faced the giant. And he's seen God when he needed forgiveness. He has seen God. David saw God by remembering everything that God had done for him. second way we see him honor God is that he took time to express praise he says because your love I, I could have dwelt for the whole sermon on this line I'm not going to do it today but what a beautiful line listen to this because your love is better than life you letting that sink into your heart God's love is better than life. And because of that, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. This psalm, in part, David's picturing a time of corporate worship where he's been with the people of God, he's been in the sanctuary, and he's worshipped there. And part of our time together, when we come together here as Christians, part of our time together needs to be celebrating God. Celebrating God. Think about the things we celebrate. Nothing wrong with it. We celebrate the birth of a new baby. We celebrate when a couple gets married. We celebrate when a team wins a championship. We celebrate when we get a good report card. 
We celebrate when we get some kind of a career advancement. These are celebration moments in life, and we have many of them. They're those high-five moments in life, right? But none of them compare to the reasons we have to celebrate God. We have so much to celebrate. And brothers and sisters, when our worship is about us, when our worship is about us, we cannot be celebrating Him. Remember this. We have a risen Savior. He is alive today the tomb is empty we have been forgiven we have been empowered to live a new life we have reason to celebrate today and you don't celebrate by sitting with your hands in your lap there is no other realm of life where we sit with our hands in our lap and say, this is really celebrating. David says, my lips will glorify you. One of the strengths of our heritage in churches of Christ, I believe, is our congregational singing where we encourage everybody to be a part as we lift our praise to God rather than just listening to some people praise God. I think that's a strength. But honestly, I've got to tell you, I'm amazed. For instance, during the invitation song, when I stand here and look out at the congregation, I'm amazed at how few people are singing. I hope that doesn't reflect on how you feel toward God. Maybe some of you are embarrassed. Well, I don't sing well. You know what? Nobody cares what you sound like. Well, let me rephrase that. If there's someone here who cares what you sound like, they've got the problem, not you. But I will guarantee you this. God loves your voice because Jesus said it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. And so when you're praising God, he loves the sound of your voice. But David also talks about being physically involved in worship. He says at the end of verse 4, And in your name I will lift up my hands. Oops, David did not get the memo, did he? He didn't get the memo that says we don't do that anymore. Did you know that lifting hands is encouraged at least 12 times in Scripture? And just for those of you who say, well, it's the Old Testament, it doesn't count, it's, it's encouraged in the New Testament too. And not, uh, I am convinced that the reason we took our position on lifting hands when we did, the way we did, it was nothing more than a knee-jerk reaction against the Pentecostals. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Knee jerking against something is going to injure your knee. You're going to end up with physical problems as a result of it, okay? Knee jerking is not a good way to determine how we relate to God. Lifting hands is a beautiful expression of worship. It's a way of surrendering. When we tell someone we're surrendering, what do we do? Palms down... Uh, palms up, I surrender. It's also like a baby calling out to mom or dad to pick them up. I mean, it is a beautiful, natural expression of worship that for many people who respond in physical ways to things, we are tying their hands with ropes and telling them they can't do that. When we have nothing with which to base that on, other than I don't like it.
But David also thinks about personal worship here too. He's also talking about personal worship. In verse 6 he says, On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Is he encouraging insomnia here? No, he's not. But I think it's simply a way of David saying, I am obsessed with you, God. I can't get you off my mind. When I wake up for a few minutes at night, guess where my mind goes? It goes to you, God. You're all I can think about. It's interesting that the word think here is the same word that's used back in Psalm 1 that I keep going back to where there it's translated as meditate. And what does meditate mean in Hebrew? It comes from the word for a cow chewing its cud. It means that you chew on it and you digest it. And he's saying, that's what I do with you, God. I just, I just chew on the thoughts of you. Then he says in verse 7, Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand uphold me. Isn't that a beautiful thought about being in the shadow of the wings of God? Uh, some, pick, some people, and Jesus even uses the illustration of him being like a mother hen that wants to gather its chicks under its wings. I mean, we can use that example from this passage, but I think David's mind is somewhere else. I think David's mind is on the Ark of the Covenant. You know, he's been real familiar with the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, he had it moved back to Jerusalem. You remember that? And so he's familiar with the Ark of the Covenant. And if you look at a description of the Ark in uh, the Old Testament, this is pretty close to what it would have looked like. And you see that those angels that are up on top of that chest, they have their wings spread toward the middle where they nearly touch. And if you look at a description from the Old Testament of where the mercy seat of God is, it's right under those wings. In other words, for the Israelites, the presence of God is right there. The presence of God, the mercy seat, was right under those outspread wings. And I think David is saying, that's where I want to be. I want to be where you are, God. I want to be in your presence. So then he says in verse 9, those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. And you might think, David, you were going really good. You were, things were going really well. This is a weird way to end this psalm. In fact, I nearly didn't deal with these verses at all. They seem out of character. But it seems to me, as I look at it, it seems that David has come to a realization that the wicked, and who's the wicked in his mind at this point? It's either Saul who's pursuing him, or it's his son Absalom who's pursuing him, whichever the case. He, he, he's recognizing that they are not going to prevail. And what he's saying is, I'm going to commit myself, I'm going to commit this situation to God, and I'm going to continue to praise you, God, and I'm going to let you take care of this situation. So let's be challenged today to seek after God, to thirst for God, to engage in activities that will enhance our spiritual intensity, to be more consistent with the spiritual disciplines of prayer and scripture reading and chewing the cud, meditating. To think of ways that we can add freshness to our relationship with God. There's all kinds of ways we can do that. Let me just give you some simple ones this morning. One way that you might add some freshness to your relationship with God is try saying a prayer for the meal after you finish it instead of before. 
Now, this is an old Jewish practice, by the way. See, we thank God for what he's about to provide. The Jews would enjoy the meal and then thank God that they got to enjoy that meal together. Try doing that. Just add some kind of fresh wrinkle to your spiritual life. Or, or sit in a different place. I know this is... I know this is <laughs> there ain't going to be two of you do this next week. I'm kidding. I hope to... Try sitting in a different place in here to, next week. It may give you a whole different perspective on the body of Christ. I accidentally put my stuff down in the second pew today. And Beverly was going to sit down like a very obedient wife. <laughs> she wants to make sure that people know that. <laughs> but then I realized that I moved. Hey, we can't sit there. Well, that's not where we sit. Try something somewhere different. Add some new wrinkle to uh, a freshness to your life. Try reading out of another version of the Bible in your daily devotionals. And I'm saying those simple kinds of things, and you can come up with a hundred like them. I'm saying that to say this. We are creatures of habit, and habits can lead to rigidity and staleness. And finally, I want to encourage you this morning to find a spiritual partner to have a person that you can share with to have someone that you can cry with that you can celebrate with even as more than half of you choose not to heed the advice of our spiritual shepherds by being involved in a life group I am more convinced today than I was when we began them nine years ago that life groups are a vital way of keeping us fresh and connected with each other. And I'm seeing that played out right now in Morris and y'all's life group where you've had several people in your life group that are going through critical things and y'all are just taking care of each other in such a beautiful way. I'm more convinced than ever that we need to be doing this. And if you think, well, I don't need it, well, how about somebody else? They may need you. You ever think about that? I know we're busy people, but it's amazing how people can become so ruled by the urgent that they end up missing out on the important. Henry Nouwen, one of my favorite devotional writers, uh, he really wrote this for pastors, preachers, but it really has application for all of us. And I want, I want you to hear these words. He says, in general, we are very busy people. We have many meetings to attend, many visits to make, many services to lead. Our calendars are filled with appointments, our days and weeks filled with engagements, and our years filled with plans and projects. There is seldom a period in which we do not know what to do and we move through life in such a distracted way that we do not even take the time and rest to wonder if any of the things that we think, say, or do are worth thinking, saying, or doing. We simply go along with the many musts and oughts that have been handed on to us and we live with them as if they were the authentic translations of the gospel of our Lord. Thus, we are busy people just like other busy people, rewarded with the rewards that are rewarded to busy people. Well, one of the most enduring advertising slogans came out of a, a time of extreme competition. Back in the 1960s, when Pepsi Cola and RC Cola and several other colas were... Uh, coming out in force Coca-Cola was looking for a new motto and the motto they came up with was this it's the real thing and do you know what the implications of that were during that time you can try the imitations those other colas but there's only one real one And once you've tried the real one, you're not going to want any of the imitations. And our world is competing 
for our attention. The world is competing for our affections. And it's offering us all kinds of inferior products to try to fill us and satisfy us. And none of them are going to do it. But I know from personal experience that if you will seek His presence and if you will honor Him in real personal worship and not just moving through a ritual, and if you intentionally look for ways to ignite your passion, you're going to find a personal, vibrant, fresh walk with God. And once you've tried the real thing, you will never be satisfied with a substitute again. So we're going to offer an invitation in just a moment. We'd love to see someone come and be joined in baptism to Jesus this day. Uh, we offer a time for prayer. If you want to come forward and express that, or you can go to room 102, where you can pray with an elder and his wife. But... Mark, be making your way up here. I want us all to stand first, and I want us to just recite this one verse of Psalm 63 together before we sing. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Let's sing. Oh, God. You are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh, God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step. I send you greetings from many loved ones, brothers and sisters in Tabacundo, Ecuador, uh, house parents, staff, and some 40 Hacienda of Hope orphans who you guys partner with and who love you and who you love, uh, who have a, have a bed to sleep in, a roof over their head, and warm food in their belly in, in part because of you who receive uh, an education and an education on, on who Jesus is in part because of you and who who receive counseling uh, to to work through issues that they've encountered in their lives and in hopes of reuniting them with a family that's more prepared to handle them because of you and I could go on and on but your brothers and sisters send you their greetings and their thanks secondly today